God actually is trying to save you, man. He really doesn't want you to go to hell. It's not like this just burning landscape where you've not done what you're told, you've been a bad boy, God gives you a spank and then sends you to eternal damnation. Instead, it's a spiritual condemnation from which is being fulfilled from your own will. God wants to save you you're the one condemning yourself. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy where we try to better our perceptions of the world through philosophical discussion. Today's episode I'm going to be reviewing Alex O'Connor's video, Is God a Dictator? I haven't really watched this video yet. I haven't really understood uh, the gist of the argument but I did hear I think the first opening minute of, of what he was saying which is essentially he is going to review Christopher Hitchens position of whether God would be or the the script the, the God of scripture the God within the uh, uh, the Christian tradition would be a dictator akin to a kind of North Korean tyrannical leader it is a totalitarian belief it is the wish to be a slave it is the desire that there be an unalterable unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep, who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance around the clock every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born, and even <clears throat> worse, and where the real fun begins after you're dead. <laughs> a celestial North Korea Who wants this to be true? Who but a slave desires such a ghastly fate? I've been to North Korea. It is the most revolting and utter and absolute and heartless tyranny the human species has ever evolved. But at least you can fucking die and leave North Korea. Although it is a bit absurd, you know, talking about God being the celestial North Korea, and I think it shows an ignorance to the essence of God being shared amongst humanity, you know, God and spirit sharing our existence. Whatever you shall do to, unto the least of my brothers, you do unto me. He is sharing in our suffering, so he wouldn't really want to be a dictator anyway. But even if you did sort of see it that way, it, it misses the... The, the point of what a dictator is or what a ty uh, or what tyranny is and Aristotle does a really good job of explaining that tyranny is different to monarchy and it, it, even if you were to accept that God is a kind of monarch you know the king of kings that doesn't make him a tyrant a tyrant is someone who acts in accordance with their own interests regardless of how it affects others where the the idea of God is quite the inverse the, the go God is the good. He is the universal good. So our interests are necessarily respected in God's will. So it's not to say that there is this uh, celestial being who is uh, like vicious and malice and who we owe our allegiance to and, and so on. Quite the opposite. It, it's to say that there is this celestial being, this, well, celestial even is a bit loaded, but there is this being which shares in all of the goodness and virtue that exists and that we as willing agents within the world can look to this being as the source and the result of everything good that everything that we would could want to be he is the the best leader we would ever want so we would want him to tell us what to do it'd be like please tell me the right answer rather than you know leave us in the dark and leave us to suffer but let's see what alex says and characteristic argument that Christopher Hitchens ever made about religion is his famous depiction of God as a celestial dictator. God doesn't exist, but even if he did, this would be a terrible injustice since it would amount to us living under a tyrannical dictatorship comparable to living in North Korea. I remember being impressed by this argument when I first heard it, not least because it was usually presented as if it was part of a stand-up comedy routine, it's also terribly confronting. Why would we desire to be constantly surveilled? Why would anybody want there to be an unquestionable authority? But in the spirit of good faith, and in a continuing effort to distance myself from my wannabe Hitchens phase, I wanted to explore this particular argument and look at some of the ways that it might be responded to. I'm increasingly suspicious that it really works as an argument at all, and I think it might demonstrate both a misunderstanding of the wrongness of dictatorship and also the nature of God. But 
I would agree. I think that's bang on. I think that it does misunderstand both the wrongness of dictatorship and the nature of God, primarily because dictatorship isn't necessarily an authoritarian regime. It's not that there is one person who is commanding. You could have a monarchy, in theory a justified monarchy, you know, a constitutional monarch, even in a Hegelian sense, who was necessarily um, doing the interests of the people and the people wanted them to rule. Aristotle talks about this, Hegel talks about this, there are many individuals who are pro-democracy. Aristotle's a, a Democrat, but he still thinks there could be justified monarchs, you know, throughout history. And so there is a difference between a monarch and uh, a, a tyrant. But I think what's more telling about the, the, the way in which God commands is that God's will would ac- accord with reason. So God's will is our freedom. It is the rational will. It is what we are trying to attune ourselves to, which is why the the idea of free will at the time of St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, was really to to be in accordance with the will of God. It was one and the same. It wasn't necessarily a, 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 a essentially a contest of wills. So we need to respect that or reflect upon what it means to will as an individual rationally and whether that would go with or against a, a, a divine command. But I'm not sure. We'll see how we do. To begin analysing this, we need to ask a question that might sound strange, but is very rarely asked in political conversation. What's actually wrong with dictatorship? If it is wrong, what makes it wrong? Why is it a bad idea to give a single individual ultimate authority over the affairs of citizens and the laws that govern them. After all, throughout history and in some places today, people have been highly receptive to dictatorships. They can have considerable public support. Before we can say what is wrong with a dictator, we need to ask what is justified authority. And uh, that I think is answered very well by Aristotle, which is it's an authority which is reflecting the interests and the the wishes or the the the, the good of those who are being governed. In which case, a justified authority is a a reflection of the reason of those who are constitutionally um, connected. You know, it is the the rational will of all the participants within uh, a given, we would have said polis, but, you know, uh, civilization that would then look towards this leader and this leader's will as reflecting their own, as reflecting the good or the universal good of the people, of those who are being governed. They're also seen as more effective at getting things done compared to the long and drawn out process of debating legislation and elections and democracy. Bold to call what we have a democracy. (laughs) Order, I, order, order. I must ask the honourable gentleman, order. As has sometimes been said of the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, he made the trains run on time. In pl- And that's actually a myth. He made one train run on time. He made one, tra- and it was the train that got him to be essentially anointed to, to, to be leader. It was where he got his leadership from. So he made one train run on time, and that was enough for his simps to essentially say he got the trains to run on time. He got one train to run on time once. Plato's Republic, a foundational philosophical text that imagines a hypothetical perfect city-state, we're introduced to the concept of a philosopher king, who Plato thought was the best possible leader of this perfect republic. This would not be someone who is elected by the people, but rather someone trained from birth to have a genuine knowledge of truth and goodness, which makes them best placed to rule a nation. It wasn't just that they were trained from birth as well. They also had to have uh, the necessary requisite skills, which would be uh, of a philosopher, like the capacity of reason, like highly attuned reason. And so it's not just that they're that they're trained from birth. They've actually been eugenically bred <laughs> to, be, to, be the, to be the philosopher king. They're not corrupt. <laughs> they're not trying to impress They're just actually the best people for the job. This sounds a lot like dictatorship. And it actually was because uh, uh, people don't realise this, but Plato as well, one of his uncles, and I think it it might have been his father and his uncle, but it was one of, I think it was what definitely said one of his uncles was part of the 30 tyrants who are installed by the Spartans after the fall of Athenian democracy. And so he was actually very much uh, um, pro-oligarchy or rather pro-aristocracy. 
uh, and it was this idea of the the rule of the elite that because democracy had essentially nearly destroyed Athens so it wasn't simply that Plato was looking towards like who could be the best ruler from a kind of outside position but also historically his family had been tied into a situation in which they had to be the anointed leaders of a crumbling civilization democracy had nearly destroyed them uh, and some awful things happened under under that democracy, uh, I think it was the Peloponnesian Wars, that ultimately nearly un- uh, undermined Athens as a city-state. And it was the 30 tyrants which sort of got them back on track. Aristotle later comes uh, onto the scene and says that the 30 tyrants were actually uh, somewhat good for Athens because of how bad and corrupt their uh, democracy had become. And instead proposes that it, democracy is the best form of, of governance but it can also become corrupt like all other forms of governance. And at times, other forms of governance and aristocracy would be better. So what's the problem with this? Ideally, we would have a dictator who knows what's best for his or her citizens, cares for the interests of those citizens, has a good understanding of truth and goodness, and takes decisive action in producing the best and most stable society. This would be far better and simpler to live under than... Trump versus Biden and unending election campaigns, you know, voting for the legislature and the president and council elections, mayoral elections. Ugh. Of course it would. Of course this would be better. But the problem is that this is a pipe dream. Few, if any, human beings are capable in practice of being such a dictator. Indeed, even Plato recognizes that whilst philosopher kings are hypothetically the ideal rulers, it's not obvious that they could actually exist in practice. Didn't they try to make the Republic and it failed terribly as well? <laughs> it didn't actually work. The problem with dictatorship is the fallibility of the dictator. The problem with dictatorship, I wish it was the fallibility of the dictator. It's part of more, it's, I think Aristotle's more correct in saying it's not just that they are rationally fallible, but they are uh virtuous their their virtue is fallible and so it's the fallibility of their virtues of their capacity to reason correctly ethically politically so it's not that they even if they had the best interests at heart yes of course they could reason wrongly and make bad decisions but also what they see as good and bad and what they see as virtuous and vicious is very one-sided it's very um easily corrupted because it's one individual and since one individual like the reason why you this person should be the leader in the first place which is what aristotle points out is because their virtue is so much greater than anyone else's that this one person is by far superior to lead if that person becomes corrupted their tyranny is equally as harsh it is equally as negative as it could be positive and since the necessary prerequisites of this leader are so great you know the idea of this perfect uh virtuous being then they they necessarily fail and are easily replaced by uh, an aristocracy or a democracy in a way which respects a greater base of virtue which could then make decisions in a way which is less one-sided and less likely to become corrupted sure a perfect dictator sounds fantastic but of course dictators are also humans and humans are simply never perfect. Because of this, in practice, dictatorships are prone to falling into disaster. Without sufficient means to hold one to account, a dictator can exercise cruel and arbitrary power. He can become tyrannical and oppressive. He can be corrupt or malicious or both. And even if we find a dictator with (laughs) genuine or insane, (laughs) genuinely pure intentions, he can still simply get things factually wrong, make a mistake, and accidentally lead his country into ruin because nobody could stop him. These are the fears that compel people to reject dictatorship. The Americans overthrew the British monarchy because the monarch was unjustly taxing them. The Allies overthrew... I mean, it it wasn't just the monarch. Uh, It is worth saying that this was after our revolution and our parliament, our parliament was unjust and unjustly taxing them. So it, it's not just the king, but it, it was uh, actually, inarguably, the aristocrats. <laughs> Through Nazism, because Hitler was a murderous, cruel expansionist, the true evil of dictatorship always lies in the evil of the dictator. But what if we could have a perfect dictator? What if we could be governed by a being who was genuinely perfect. Hopefully you can see the point by now. 
If the problem with dictatorship in the first place is the fallibility and corruptibility and imperfection of the dictator, then a necessarily infallible and incorruptible and perfect dictator would seemingly not be something to worry about. Yeah, precisely. I think that is actually a really, a really well um, structured uh, position of why it would not, like, why Christ would not be the same as, let's say, Hitler or someone. It, it, he is God. He is goodness, and sort of conflate him with a contingent being when he is the a perfect being. I think is a mistake to make. So I think that's actually a really good. Uh, a good way of phrasing it. At least not in the same way. And this seems to me the problem with Christopher Hitchens drawing an analogy between human beings and God. Remember, you might think that the idea of God is silly or that God doesn't exist, but Hitchens isn't arguing about the existence of God. He's just saying that if it were the case that such a God existed, it would be a bad thing. But if the reason it would be a bad thing is because it would be analogous to a dictatorship, then when we consider that what it is that seems to make human dictatorships evil and wrong is something about being human, that is, corruptibility, evil, malice. If these things don't apply to God, then the analogy simply doesn't work. Indeed, if there were a person who genuinely knew with 100% certainty, infallibly, what was best for you, better than you could ever hope to know yourself, and genuinely wanted the best for you, and gave you commands and guidance about how to live in the best possible way, then provided this person is genuinely infallible and genuinely benevolent, it would be perfectly irrational not to do everything that person told you to. And that is basically Aristotle's argument for, uh, a, for a virtuous uh, uh, leader. If, if you were to have a virtuous uh, monarch, I think someone who was so far beyond in virtue of everyone else around them, then you should make him your monarch. That or exile him. And the reason why you should exile him is because he could not ever be ruled by you. And so if you were to establish a governance which would rule him or her, you would uh, essentially be confining that individual to uh, an, uh, a, an unjustified prison of vice within your political regime. Uh, and so it it, do, it doesn't make sense to say that you should not let this person rule or have that person rule through some other political mechanism because the combined virtue of the state would never amount to the virtue of this individual. Obviously, in Aristotle, he basically says that this, this doesn't really usually exist in an individual, like a single uh, person. At least it doesn't anymore for the Hellenics or the Hellenes. So that's Aristotle's position. And he says that it's instead better to look towards democracy because the combined virtue of the many supersedes the virtue of the few uh, in aristocracy and in monarchy. It's also harder to corrupt. It's not impossible, It's harder, but it's harder to corrupt because more individuals need to be corrupted and uh, there's less corrective mechanisms. And this, of course, is a description of God an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving being who actually knows what's best for you and actually wants it. Of course, you could respond that the gods of world religions are not perfectly moral, they're not benevolent, like the Christian god commanding genocide in the Old Testament or condemning homosexuals and the like. But Hitchens isn't making a point about a particular god. He's making the point that, in principle, the existence of an omniscient god in general is a terrible Thing. Hitchens is claiming that even the existence of the god that Christians claim to believe in, that is one who is triomni, meaning omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, would be a terrible tyranny. That just seems to me to misunderstand what it is that makes dictatorship so unfavorable. We can see this in how Hitchens casually conflates dictatorship with tyranny and treats them as if they mean the same thing when they don't. A dictator it could easily be argued that the dictatorship of um, Julius Caesar, for example, was essential for the survival of the Romans, and in fact, undid a lot of the uh, the harms that the Senate brought around. For uh, I mean, that's one example where you could say that the uh, the and the Romans even had it as an act of the Senate, where they could elect a dictate at a time of crisis, where they're like, okay, this guy, listen to him, because we're in an absolute we're in absolute mayhem, and so for this time only we we elect this person to be our decisive uh, leader who will essentially get things done and and i think that there is an argument there to say that sometimes it 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 can be virtuous to have a dictator 
that doesn't mean that you would have i don't believe in dictatorship i'm a democrat you know i believe in democracy but i I think that it makes sense to say that there are occasions where dictators have even been better than their aristocratic or um democratic counterparts uh you know you can even think about a in in ill-educated population which might be the result of having been enslaved to an aristocracy but the establishment of the of a direct democracy overnight would be uh, a disaster you, all you have to look to is brexit you know the population voted for brexit the population i've got a fucking clue what brexit was going to do now the population wish they hadn't voted for brexit and that's only one example of how you know in democracy the collective intelligence of what or the collective uh, virtue of a population uh, lack the specific technical skill to make an informed decision at times and so you know we should be looking towards those who know the issue is is that how do we know that they know and they will start to arise with various problems and this is where you need trust and it, it's very difficult in such a a world in which, where people are so easily corruptible hater is simply someone who has absolute power over a country a tyrant is someone who exercises that power in a cruel and oppressive or unreasonable or arbitrary manner. If a perfect god existed, then even if he could be described as a dictator, it would be difficult to describe him as a tyrant, since a loving god would certainly not be cruel and oppressive, and it would be impossible for him to be unreasonable, being a perfectly rational being. Once you're talking about god, you're no longer talking about a being who is susceptible to the things that make dictatorships tyrannical. And just before we move on, here's something interesting for you. Just listen to the following exchange between Christopher Hitchens and a radio host. So what if God actually exists, sir? Would he not have been good to you? No. Uh, He wouldn't. Because if that were true, it would mean that I had an eternal supervising parent who would never die and let me get on with my life, never let me grow up, would keep me under surveillance. But you have, sir. And supervision every, every minute of my but, life. But and you constantly have. Asked, and constantly asked me to be thanking and praising him. Yeah. I well, think it would that be, wasn't part like, of the scenario. Like living in North Korea. I, I, I think it would be a horrible outcome. Well, not sure that, that, that God is Kim Jong-il, but what if what I said is well, true? Well, uh, Kim Jong-il, he has a different opinion. A classic and underrated hitch slap. But it also seems to sum up the point that I'm trying to make here. To risk killing the joke by dissecting the frog, Hitchens is of course mocking Kim Jong-il for thinking he's some kind of god in the way that he acts and behaves. And that's precisely the problem with dictatorships. Human beings attempting to hold an office that could only be reasonably held by a god. Yeah, precisely. I mean, that's the Aristotle basically makes that point where it's like you are basically demanding a god. Uh, when you ask for a dictator, yeah. Isn't that interesting? But okay, isn't there another problem to deal with here? Sure, okay, it would be in our interests to follow the dictates of a perfect god. But what of freedom? Isn't that important too? Even if going against god's guidance would ultimately be... It is, and this is where, like, when we look towards the philosophy of freedom, you'd see that the continentals, we would argue freedom is reason, and since god is... Uh, let's say the bedrock of all rational values, the logos, then to act in accordance with him would be to be free. And which is why Hegel would say there is no separation between free will and divine providence, which is why you should be able to accept divine providence and yet realize that you are a free agent capable of free decisions in a world which is uh, dictated by a universal self. And this is the point, like when you, when you think you are separate from God, you've made the mistake. You share in the existence of God. He made you. you he is your efficient cause and he's also your material cause or he's your, and your formal cause is part, partakes in him or the archetypical idea of you partakes in him. Everything about you, your final cause partakes in him. And so the universality of what it means to, to be a particular means to partake It means to partake in the universality of God. And so when we look towards, let's say, the arguments given by Thomas Aquinas, the arguments given by Hegel, to be rational is to be free and to be and to be rational and to have faith are supposed to be identical, which is why the Catholic view is to see that faith and reason should coincide. They should not be in contest. And so, like, when you look towards, uh, let's say, contemporary 
usually Protestant views of freedom, uh, or Protestant nominalist views of freedom, it often comes from a one-sided conception of freedom, where the, the, the agent is free if they get what they want, you know, they are unrestricted, a will that exists that is unrestricted in a Hobbesian sense, or they are uncaused. They are, you know, it breaks like a causal chain. They don't have anything which uh, allows that, you know, sort of um, manifests their behavior outside of themselves. Well, Hegel has a really great response to this. So to get what you want isn't always in your interests, okay? So how do you know what you're getting what you want is what your preference is? Like, how do you know your preference is what you want? You need to have an idea of knowledge of what you want, which means you really want truth. And if you want the truth of the self, then what you want is to be perfectly rational. And so you need to, so what you want is essentially to know what you want. And to know what you want is to act in accordance with your function and to act in accordance with what is actually good for you. It's not to necessarily just achieve some sort of end goal. The next point is to say, like, to, in terms of causation, to say that you would want to be uncaused, it, it leads you to an abstraction of what he calls the unhappy consciousness, where you become alienated from any possible desire, where essentially any manifestation of your desires leads to a kind of blank slate. You become like a, what he describes as like a Brachman. But in reality, it's, it's probably more like... Um, you know, it, it relates to the kind of the stoic, the desire to be free of this life and, and to be in accordance with a kind of pure reason external to a, a contingent reality. And, and, and you end up with not being able to have any desires at all. And so what you really want, again, is to be able to give uh, direction to your desires, to be able to understand the position you're in and act in accordance that, uh, to act in accordance with the rational uh, belief or, or a true justified belief from the position you're in. That's what it means to be free. It doesn't mean to simply get whatever you want or to um, sort of be uncaused absolutely. And this really relates back again to the idea of freedom which was per perpetuated by the scholastics and by Thomas Aquinas. To be free is to be rational not necessarily just to achieve anything you want. It's also worth noting that Hegel says that the separation between um, humanity and God isn't uh, a, re a, a real separation. It's a limitation. You are a limitation of God. So God, you share in part of the essence of God, right? Of the existence of God. And so that, I mean, that's the Holy Spirit, if you want to think of it like that. And so if you think of it like that, then your goodness is only really understood in reference to the goodness of God. This You share the same essence. And so if God is directing reality, is is directing reality in a way which accords to the universality of goodness, which is the particular goods of all possible beings. So you are, in fact, included in the particular, uh, in the universal, which is why he says the particular finds itself in the universal. And moreover, if you have this view, then you realize that that means that the essence of what it means to be you, or the substance of what it means to be you, brings in cause and effect. So in acting with the a rational inferential relationship of of uh, let's say material reality or rather the reality of what we exist in today you know something which shows that there is a beginning to the universe and an end to the universe and we can have physical laws from which we can predict certain behaviors and so on is not to go against your will but to act in accordance with your will you aren't being restricted you are giving the basis of freedom you are giving the basis to act in such a way as you can make predictable, rational judgments against a world which is predictably rational. Shouldn't we be free to make that choice for ourselves? Isn't always doing what somebody else tells us incompatible with freedom? Hitchens seems to think so. Um, I'd say that the, to me that what matters most is the pursuit of happiness, in the words of our greatest founding father, uh, and the pursuit of liberty, freedom, and that these things are incompatible, completely incompatible with the worship of an unalterable celestial dictator. That makes the concept of the pursuit of freedom and happiness completely negative, negates it. But I'm not so sure that this would be the case just because theism is true. After all, the mere existence of a god who watches over everything and tells you that certain things are right and others are wrong does not remove your freedom to act as you please. You can still freely choose to do whatever you like. It's just that the existence of a god would mean that- Don't, don't we know it, right guys? <laughs>
that whatever you do is noticed and perhaps appropriately punished or rewarded. Now, Hitchens would probably respond to this by saying that actually, yes, you are essentially forced to act in a particular way because God threatens you with hellfire if you don't do so. Not imposed? Did you really say not imposed? What if you reject this offer? What are you told by, what have you been told for centuries by Christians? If you reject this offer that took place by means of a torture to death of a human being that you didn't want and should have prevented if you could, what if you reject the office? If you, if, you, if you accept it, you can have eternal life and your sins are forgiven. Oh, great. What a horrible way to abolish your own responsibility and get your own bliss. I, I think it's so strange to say it's an abolishment of responsibility because it's quite the opposite. It's actually an acceptance of responsibility, which is why it's the sacrament of reconciliation is, you know, it's the, to reconcile yourself with God, to reconcile yourself with the, the divine will. I mean, even if you, you look towards this... Um, this idea of um, a hellfire, you know, like one, like you can look to the Bible as, as allegorical, not necessarily literal, you know, the word of God, not the words of God, you know, it's not that it's a place that's literally on fire. Um, but the, let's look at two things. One, what it means to be in hell, and two, why you end up there so the, the, they're very intimately connected one what it means to be in hell thomas aquinas talks about this saint thomas aquinas and he basically argues that hell is the frustration of the wicked will the punishment in hell is not necessarily a, a sort of physical manifestation of like you're being tortured by demons and blazing fire and you know like you know the kind of artistic the kind of artistic depictations that we often see. Instead, it is the frustration of your desire to be wicked and often of things like greed, gluttony, lust. It is that you share in these vicious, in these vices that is frustrating you. It's causing you suffering. It's causing you spiritual suffering. And that the more you want, the more you are unable to achieve what you want. And so you end up frustrating yourself to the point in which your desire is causing you burning agony. And it's 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 more of a, a a point of why vice is a bad thing. It leads to a spiritual form of agony, a spiritual form of suffering, and that's why being unethical is bad to you as much as to others. The next point is to say, how do you get there? Well, you get there because you've acted in such a way as to propagate these vices. You are not repentant for this, so you continue to propagate these vices because you can't at any time repent. You know. In the, you know, the hallowing of hell, you know, you can, you know, come to God at any time. So it's not like you, you necessarily are stuck being this vicious person. You choose this and, you, you know, you choose to reject God in this respect. And often you've committed some of the most vile atrocities imaginable. You know, you've committed rape and murder and torture and the, the desire to cause such harm is causing you harm. So it's not like this uh, just burning landscape where you've not done what you're told, you've been a bad boy, God gives you a spank and sends you to eternal damnation. Instead, it's a spiritual condemnation from which is being fulfilled from your own will. God wants to save you. You're the one condemning yourself. You don't want it. Oh, you don't? Well, then you can go to hell. This is not imposed? This is perhaps the most important consideration of this video in that a lot hinges on it. In my view, if hell does exist, and it is a place of infinite torment as a punishment for rejecting God, then I think Hitchens is quite right to say that this is enforcement, and it does negate human freedom. You're not really acting freely if you've been threatened to act in a particular way. It would be like a thief saying, sure, you can choose. I think it's not even like a threat as much as it is uh, an, an inescapable consequence of your actions. This, is, this goes against what is rational. And if you do something which is irrational, well, you are going to face the consequence of your actions. You are not going to achieve your goal. This is the whole, like, you can't perform an action which is inherently irrational and expect it to lead towards the conclusions which were otherwise uh, incorrectly assumed to be the result. So you are necessarily going to end up with a result you did not predict. And this is the, the, the logical truth of this. It's not to say that God is punishing or enforcing some sort of punishment, but rather this is the result of acting against what is good. Who's not to give me your wallet if you want? 
but I will shoot you in the head if you don't. Your decision. You're not really being offered a choice here. But this simply isn't the only conception of what hell is. And something which Hitchens needs to consider is that you can be a theist without having this conception of hell, or indeed, without thinking hell exists at all. For many theists, hell is not primarily pure. There is actually one of the, one of my old philosophy uh, teachers back at A level used to say he was a priest, and he said one of the things that you know is with about hell, it's like hell could exist but be internally unoccupied, uh, and it's it's not to say that we necessarily must go to hell because we could become repentant with enough time, you know, from a Kantian perspective, for example, that if there was an, the immortality of the soul would lead us towards uh, the resolution of the categorical imperative, right? We will resolve uh, ethics. And so if you did, like, there are theists that definitely take a view in which, you know, like, even if hell exists, it, it, it might be empty. No one might be there. Punitive. It's not some kind of way for God to get back at you for the wrong things that you've done in your life. Indeed, that doesn't make much sense given that God can't be harmed in any way by the behaviour of humans. Instead, hell is thought of as simply the natural result of sin. Hell just rep- I mean, to say that God can't be harmed by the result of humans, I think, I think it's not to say that God can be harmed by humans, but God can share in our suffering. Remember that anything that exists necessarily has to have God there because God is the basis of existence. And so even the rejection of God is only a limitation of God's existence. It, it, it can't even, like, this is why it's the, it's the privation of goodness, but not the absolute abolishment of goodness in the uh, Augustian, uh, from an Augustian theological standpoint. So, you know, even in hell, God is present even in hell. You know, Jesus descends into hell and he, he seeks to free those in hell. God is invested in you. God doesn't want you to suffer. And God wants to save you. And so like this is the I think the Christian point is to say that actually God wants doesn't want you to go to hell. That's that's the whole point. That's why this whole you know, this is the whole point of the Bible and the whole point of, of the Christian doctrine is to say like God actually is trying to save you, man. He really doesn't want you to go to hell. It represents a separation from God. It's not some literal place of flames and torture. It's just wherever souls go that don't want union with God. And maybe you think that this view of hell is mistaken, but there are a great deal of theists who believe in it. And if you don't like it, consider that there are a lot of theists who don't believe in hell at all, or think that hell is merely a metaphor. If I were religious, I think I'd be inclined towards a position called annihilationism, the view that if you don't go to heaven, you simply cease to exist altogether. And one of the Right. Yeah. So I think that's actually a really great point. I think annihilationism is really uh, interesting. I think that the point of annihilationism wouldn't be to say that if you didn't go to heaven, you would cease to exist altogether. I mean, some people might take that position, but I think that the, the counter argument would be to say that if you couldn't go to heaven, then you would never have existed in the first place. I would be more inclined to say that the, 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 free to, the freedom to choose to not be in communion with God is respected by God. It's just not God who's doing that to you. So I would say there is a hell. If you, if you were to commit atrocities, um, you know, let's say like Hitler, and then you, you know, at the end of your life, you, you know, essentially end up in a frustrated, wicked state in, in spiritual damnation. I wouldn't say that would lead to non-existence. I think if it was the absolute rejection of good, I think it would lead to the smallest possible existence, if you will. Um, but it wouldn't lead to an absolute rejection of existence because then you would never have existed in the first place because what you are isn't temporal. It's, uh, it's spiritual. It's an archetypical idea in the mind of God. And so it wouldn't be to say that you didn't exist, but that you would cease to exist as much as possible as you continually frustrate your existence into the, you know, the, its smallest possible, uh, being reasons that I think this is that religious philosophy often posits God as the ground of all being. In the contingency argument, he's put forward as the necessary foundation of everything that exists, without which nothing else could exist. I think, I think Alex has grown great as, as a theologian here, though. I think this is shown a much, uh, like, from, compared to his old content, I think this, this has shown uh, Alex to be a, a, a well-developing philosopher. 
And so to reject union with him or to go somewhere where he is not after you die would be to reject being itself and cease to exist because you wouldn't have a ground for your existence anymore. But just imagine for a moment that hell is simply the natural result of sin, something that God essentially can't help. It's just somewhere people send themselves by not living a spiritually good life due to their free will. As C.S. Lewis famously said, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Or suppose hell doesn't exist. Or suppose hell is just a metaphor, a representation of the disastrous earthly consequences of wrong or misguided behavior. And suppose that whatever this hell is, it's a fate that God desperately wants you to avoid. His provision of rules and laws would then not be so much a set of authoritarian dictates, but rather an omniscient guide to getting the best possible outcome for yourself that he's giving you because he wants the best for yourself. It would be like me going to my friend who's depressed and out of shape and sleeping terribly and their life is just a misery right now. I might bang on their door and rather sternly tell them, look, you need to start waking up at 7 a.m., getting some exercise, eating properly and sleeping better. Put your phone down, delete TikTok and get outside. Shit, I should probably end this video. <laughs> if you don't, you're going to end up in hell. You're going to be anxious and sad. You're going to be out of shape and addicted to social media and isolated and jobless. And believe me, you don't want that. This isn't me being a dictator, threatening my friend to act how I want him to act. This is me telling my friend how to actualize his potential and free himself from a self-inflicted hell that he doesn't even realize he's falling into and won't be able to fully understand until he tries following my advice. Indeed, there's a strange paradox in how by restricting the number of options available to himself, by deleting TikTok and not allowing himself to stay up late, etc., he actually makes himself more free, not less by placing these I think it's often called the paradox of choice isn't it where you, the more choices you have the less freedom you have <laughs> restrictions on himself and if these kinds of rules and this kind of advice could be provided not by me to my friend but by an omniscient authority who knows better than you do how to achieve the best outcome for yourself then this might not best be depicted as a constraining tyrannical dictatorship but rather guidance on how to become truly free. Telling a sinner not to sin might be like telling a smoker not to smoke. If somebody has a nicotine addiction and this addiction is constraining their life and preventing them from freely doing what it is that they want to do, especially if the smoker doesn't know that smoking is unhealthy or doesn't realize it, somebody telling them to stop smoking might seem tyrannical and unjust and a constraint on their freedom. But it's at least possible that this order is being given not to constrain, but in an attempt to liberate. Please follow my advice. Do as I say for your own sake. I would say that this that accords very nicely with the with the view that Thomas Aquinas has, the view that Hegel has, and I think that is actually the the, the pretty much the Catholic view of of this. So like I think that's actually I think that's pretty great. I think that was like a really really well said. And at least under one interpretation, this is what's going on with religious law. But because it's coming from an omniscient authority, you can always trust that this being knows what's best for you and has your best interests at heart. This would mean that by committing yourself to following his commands about how to best live your life, you're not making yourself less free, but more free, because you're allowing yourself, in the sense of positive liberty described by Isaiah Berlin, to achieve self-actualization and self-mastery. I haven't read that. It sounds, sounds good in the way that by preventing oneself from smoking a cigarette might make them become more free because the addiction was constraining them. Of course, I don't think that sin exists in a religious sense, and I think that the sins described by particular world religions are quite ridiculous. But in principle, the idea that there could be things that we're doing that are ultimately bad, but we don't either realize that they're bad or we kind of have a compulsion to do them anyway. And the idea that following someone's guidance or commands to stop doing them, despite how much we might really want to, would actually be better for us and actually give us more freedom rather than less, I think is at least consistent. For a better understanding of a religious perspective on this issue, I recently spoke to Bishop Robert Barron, and I'll play you an excerpt of our conversation in which we discussed this particular issue. You might understand why Christopher Hitchens describes God as a tyrant, because of course, you know, God is the is the great ground of all being, but there's this idea that 
if you don't accept this or if you put a foot wrong or if you do the wrong thing, you get punished yeah, but, and in but, such a way that even if you do it inside your own head, you, you have no, this, this force that can punish you for it. Doesn't that seem <laughs> no, but, tyrannical that, to you? Yeah, that does, but that's not the right way to look at it because, see, here's something very important philosophically, that God doesn't need us. God needs nothing. God is God. The world adds nothing to God's greatness. It's a very important theological idea. God doesn't need my moral perfection. God doesn't need anything from me. God needs nothing from me. So oh, God's offended by what I... No, that's a psychologized sort of symbol of what we're talking about. God, the anger of God in the Bible, I would translate as God's passion to set things right. God hates the fact that I'm not alive. See, I don't know if I would agree that God needs nothing from us. I, I think I would actually probably... I think that God's existence as God is only possible through his dynamic relation to us. And so it is the universality of God that encompasses the particularity of existence and our, you know, limited universality, our individuality is is a necessary component for God's divinity in the sense that it brings him a... Um, a we, we are the... the we are the, 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 the sort of sets within the set of God. He doesn't necessarily need us in a way which we need him. He's not contingent. He's necessary. He's complete and he's perfect. But we are part of his perfection. And, and so it's like, it's like when God creates nature, he creates that which is good. And it's a reflection of his goodness. God's actions are the objectification of himself to the point in which he is instantiated in his incarnate form as, a, as his son which is the the uh, unity of God as his universality and his particularity made concrete in, his absol- in, in what, what Hegel describes as the absolute. And I think that when you realize that the God isn't something that is separate from us, but that is part of us, that we are part of God. And so, and I think the best explanation of this, if you want to have a look at a little diagram for this, would be um, it's... Uh, uh, what's it called? It's um, uh, panentheism. Panentheism. Uh, I think is a. Uh, I think is a good way of looking at it, where you have essentially God as the set, and then within the set is the universe, and it, it we are that set, and so God is invested in us. We are God's complexity. We are God in His infinite eternality right? Without that, he is merely timeless and lacks particularity in a concrete way. We are the individual instantiations of God in, in his actions. We are God's choices. We are God's freedom. We are, we are part of God in this, which is why he's invested so much in us. And he hates what, what I've done to myself and he wants that over he wants to burn that away and so the divine anger the divine punishment if we psychologize it as some you know kim jong un punishing his his rivals that's not it at all it's god desiring in fact going all the way into our dysfunction all the way down so that he might draw us out of it for me i think that the problem with tyranny is the tyrant the the reason why tyranny is bad the reason why it's bad to have an authoritarian dictator is because of the corruptibility of human beings. It seems to me that if there were a person or a being who genuinely knew you better than you knew yourself, genuinely wanted the best for you, and genuinely knew how to get the best for you, then it would be perfectly irrational for you to not do what they say all the time. And that this shouldn't be described as tyranny, but rather something like genuine, enlightened advice that you would be foolish not to take. Right. That's why the psalmist can say, you know, Lord, I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. The law is not some imposition on me. I love your law. It's like a, when you're learning how to play golf and someone's giving you proper instruction and it's getting into your body and now you know how to hit the darn ball. I, I love the law. Give me more of it. Give me more of the law of golf. And I'm, if I'm living <laughs> just in my God. own space, I'm going to golf any way I want to. I'll be the worst golfer in the world, right? So th- that's a better metaphor for like religious law. And that's why when the Lord says, I will write the law in your heart, that's like a golfer. I finally got it in my body. I finally have the laws in my body. So that's what God... I think that when you says to write the law in your heart, it's actually, it, it's, a, it's a combination of your reason, 
right, for one, and your ra- your rational acclamation of your essence. It is to, to, to realize what you are. There, there is the moral law within you. You know, the starry skies above and the moral law within. But the, I think Hegel takes us to a better point. It's like, this is objective. There is this truth that is written in within reality, which we can see. Augustine says the same thing, that... There, it is uh, that God allows us to perceive the order of reality. And so he is actually telling us, like, this is the order of reality. This is, you know, if you go against it, you're only hurting yourself. Stop hurting yourself. God wants to do. He wants to write the moral law in my in my heart. In a sense, you actually become more free by restricting. The- yeah, I think that's actually a good way of saying it, Maximo, that I don't think God needs us, but, his, but our presence still complements him. But I think that our presence is... It's not a need as much as our our reality is already part of God. So it's not we are depe- he is dependent upon us, but that our dependence upon him is part and parcel to bring glory to God, which is why I think our, like Aquinas says, you know, it is the telos of nature to bring glory to God. We are the we are God's glory. We are the the infinite power of God made manifest the amount of things that you can do. Yeah, and see, freedom is a great spiritual metaphor up and down the tradition because our attachments make us unfree. And when I'm freed from my attachments, I'm freed for that thing we first talked about. This realm of objective value begins to open up to me in a fresh way. As long as I'm in my little world and I'm hung up on how do people think about me and how am I doing, and then I never, the world of objective value doesn't open up to me. It's like light pollution. I never see the stars. But when I get rid of all that clutter and and distraction i can actually see the stars mm. and this is what the the tyrant of christopher hitchens description is actually doing it's not do this or else i'm going to punish you but do this because this is the right thing for you trust me do this and and things will clear a way that will enable you, a whole world to open up to you it's 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 that it is your freedom it's like you are you are willing against your own will you are willing against yourself uh, and and that it's it's to it is to like this is look mate this is what you want and this is how to get it and then someone rejecting that 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 is the idea that christians are getting at that would be the the right way to read it so <laughs> let me know what you think is god a dictator and if so is that necessarily a bad thing are his laws threatening dictates or are they guidance and advice from someone who truly wants the best for you well Alex, that was actually a top tier video. Very well done. You deserve your parents. That was actually really great. I think that shows like progression as a theolo- uh, as a theologist, as a as a philosopher. I thought that was a really great video, and I think ultimately it really nailed down the conceptions of God, and I think it uh, uh, elucidated really well the the issues that, of tyranny, uh, not necessarily being dictatorship, but being let's say, vicious dictatorship, I would probably describe it as. So that, and that was really well done. The only thing that um, I need to ask really is when is he going to be Christian? If you're this far, how long? What, 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 what must I do to get you to convert? What will convert the great Alex O'Connor? Now that that's over, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll probably review uh, something else. Prior to us existing, God wasn't God. You see, you see it as like prior to us existing. You see, God, God as God is.